Welcome to the ultimate probability guide for AP statistics. Probability can be one of the toughest topics, but one of the most important topics on the entire AP statistics exam. And the reason why is because probability kind of bleeds into almost every topic. And at the same time, there are very, well, not very, there are a whole lot of different types of probability that make it kind of difficult in terms of knowing what do I do and when do I do it. So in this video, I want to talk about as many different types of probabilities as I can, give a quick couple simple examples. That way you could really start preparing for the AP exam. So the different types of probability are basic probability, conditional probabilities, probabilities with random variables, the binomial distribution, the geometric distribution, the normal distribution, and then even probability that comes from sampling distributions, which produces p-values. All right, so let's just dive right into basic probability. So basic probability here, we're thinking about the probability of one or more events happening. Like what's the probability that uh, it rains today? Or what's the probability that there's a tornado tomorrow? So when we're thinking about basic probability, a couple of the key things is this formula right here that is on the AP stats formula sheets on the very front page. This is the probability for A or B. It is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Now, this is a very useful formula in any problem that deals with two events. Now, when you're dealing with two events, a couple key words here. First is mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive are two events that cannot happen at the same time. That means the probability of A and B is equal to zero. So if you know for a fact that two events are mutually exclusive, they cannot occur at the same time, then this back part right here, you could turn into a big, beautiful zero. Another big word, another big definition is independent events. Two independent events were, occur when one event does not impact the probability of the second event. This actually do, introduces conditional probability as well. But the idea is that the probability of A equals the probability of A on the condition of B, well, it just goes to show that B did not impact A. Now, when you know you are independent, guaranteed you know you're independent, then the probability of A and B equals the probability of A times the probability of B. If you're not independent, you have to consider the fact the probability of B might change because of A, and then you got to think about those probabilities. But if you 100% know you're independent because the question said that, then the probability of A and B, this back part right here, is simply the probability of A times the probability of B. But don't ever use that formula for A and B if you don't know you're independent. Uh, let's take a look at how this formula that I highlighted there in yellow could be used in a pretty simple example. In a certain region, the probability of a tornado is 0.14, and the probability of an earthquake is 0.09, and the probability of both a tornado and an earthquake is 0.02. Now, in a problem like this, a very popular question could be, what is the probability of a tornado or an earthquake? Well, that's pretty simple. I'm just going to use the formula. The probability of a tornado is 0.14 plus the probability of an earthquake is 0.09, and then I'm going to subtract the probability of both, 0.02. And that is going to get me the probability of a tornado or an earthquake. So 0.014 plus 0.09 minus 0.02 is 0.21. So there's a 21% chance of, on any given day, I guess, I'm getting given two specifics here, just a rough problem, but 21% chance of a tornado or an earthquake. Now, I could also check for independence here very simply because I could take the probability of tornado, multiply it by the probability of earthquake. And if I'm independent, these will equal the 0.02. That's the probability of A and B. So let me check. The probability of tornado is 0.14 times the probability of an earthquake is 0.09. If I multiply those together, I get 0.0126. So that tells me that these are not independent events, which kind of seems weird. I wouldn't think that an earthquake affects a tornado or a tornado affects an earthquake, but whatever, I just made this problem up. I'm just trying to prove to you that the idea is that you could check for independence because tornado times earthquake is not the probability of both. So anyway, pretty simple problem, pretty basic problem. There are typically questions that involve using of that formula there on the AP exam. Now, we can also use the same form and the same concept with two-way tables. Two-way tables make for great probability questions. So here we have a couple different variables. We have gender, male or female, and then we have are you satisfied 
uh, or not satisfied. So I just kind of grabbed this chart. So what are, what are we satisfied? Maybe this is the service at a, at a grocery store. They ask customers at a grocery store, are you satisfied with the, with the uh, checkout person or are you not satisfied, what have you? So 1,000 total people were surveyed and here is all the data. So we could ask tons of questions here, right? Like we could say, what's the probability that somebody is a male? Well, that's going to be a pretty easy question. There are 464 total males out of 1,000, and there it is. That's easy. Or we could say, hey, what's the probability that a customer was satisfied? And that would be, well, there was 800 total satisfied customers out of 1,000. Again, that'd be pretty easy. But then we could also ask a question like this. What is the probability that a male or someone not satisfied is selected? So we see that word or, we're gonna to have to use that formula for male or, and you can also use that, that U if you want, or not satisfied. All right, so here we're gonna start off with the probability of male. Male, like we already did, was uh, 464 total males out of the 1,000, plus not satisfied, that's 200 out of the 1,000, and then we're gonna subtract the both. Now, how do I find the both? Well, that's actually really easy. That's right there. 80 people are both male and not satisfied. I didn't need anything to figure that out, just kind of simple math. So I'm gonna subtract that away. Now let's talk about why we actually subtract that away. We're not getting rid of that, but those people got counted twice. See, these are all of the males. These are all of the not satisfied. Those 80 people right there, oh, we'll block that out, sorry. Those 80 people right there, I'll just circle it. They were counted amongst these 464 males. Those 80 people were also counted amongst the 200 people that were not satisfied. Those 80 people deserve to be counted, but they don't deserve to be double counted or, or counted twice. So that's why we subtract them away. So 464 plus 200 minus 80 is 584 out of 1,000 would be my probability there. Not too bad. All right, another question here is, is gender independent of satisfaction? So let's just kind of grab this out here. Let's say, okay, let's, let's pick a gender. It doesn't matter, male or female. What's the probability that somebody is satisfied with their service at the grocery store? And let's compare that same probability, probability of somebody satisfied, but let's attach a condition of they're a female. So let's see, does, does the gender of female change the probability of being satisfied? Now, satisfied, we already figured out, was 800 out of 1,000, which is pretty simple math to do. 800, you, I mean, probably don't even need a calculator for that, but hopefully you get that out. That's 80% or 0.8, okay? And then conditional probability, which we're gonna talk about in one more second, but just kind of show you how easy this is. Here we're saying, okay, the condition is of the female. So I'm only allowed to look at the 536 females. That limits my denominator to only looking at the females. And of those females, 416 were satisfied. Now this I do need a calculator for, 416 divided by 536 is 0.776. So this, because these are not equal, right? The probability of satisfied is 80%. The probability that you're satisfied if you're a female is 77%. This actually shows me that if you're a female, you're slightly less likely to be satisfied. These numbers need to be the same to have independence, to prove that the being a, being a female or being a male had no change on being satisfied. Should be 80% either way. Well, here it is a little bit less if you're a female. So that's another very good, very simple question for the AP exam. Now, since we're already, we're just talking about conditional probability, let's continue on to that. So conditional probability, this formula is a really nice, fairly easy one that is on the AP exam as well. It's actually right next to the probability for A or B. So uh, conditional probability, once again, is identifying the probability of A occurring given that B has occurred. So it's pretty straightforward formula. Uh, be careful that the condition always goes in the back. So be careful that the front is what you're trying to find the probability of. The behind the line is the condition given. And again, you need two different probabilities to find this. So in the numerator, it's the probability of both A and B. And then the denominator is the probability of just the condition alone. So pretty simple formula for conditional probability. Now, tree diagrams often do help with conditional probability because one outcome follows a first outcome, and, and that's why a tree diagram really helps. So let's show in this problem how we're going to use the tree diagram and then answer a conditional probability. So the probability of getting a certain disease is 4%, which automatically tells me not getting the disease is 96%. If you have the disease, a test will show a positive test 98% of the time. Okay, good. You have the disease. It should show a positive result. If you do not have the disease, the test will show a positive result 10% of the time. Well, that would be a false positive. You don't have the disease, but it says you do. 
And that typically happens with tests. So here's the question. What is the probability of having the disease given a person tested positive? So when I'm talking about, I see that word given, that means I need that line. So in front of the line is what I'm trying to find the probability of. I'm trying to find the probability that a person has the disease. Squeeze that in there. And then behind the line is the given. I'm given that they tested positive. It was a positive result. All right, so I got to figure out this, and I'm going to first determine the formula, right, with the formula that I just showed you. In the denominators, the probability of a positive result of all the people, what's the probability to get a positive result? And then in the numerator is the probability of both having the disease and getting a positive result. Now, a lot of people just kind of throw numbers from the problem into there, but you actually can't. We need to do a little bit more here. And the trick here is a tree diagram. So first, we're going to start off with a random person. There is a 4% chance that this person has the disease. I'll put a D there for disease. And that, like I mentioned earlier, is a 96% chance they don't have the disease. Now, if you have the disease and you take a test, 98% of the time you will test positive, which means 2% of the time you'll test negative. That means the test says you don't have the disease, but you do. If you don't have the disease, there is a still a 10% chance of a positive result. That's a false positive, which the good news, there's a 90% chance of a negative, and then that would be the right thing, right? So two branches are correct. You have the disease and you test positive. It's not good that you have the disease, but at least the test was correct. You don't have the disease and you test negative. That would also be correct. All right, so let's use this tree diagram to answer my question. First, the numerator is the easy part. Have the disease and test positive. That's a very simple branch. I have the disease, 0.04, and I test positive, 0.98. Now, again, the 0.98 stemmed from having the disease. So I am allowed to multiply them because the fact that the 98% was conditional on the 4%. Now, the denominator is a little bit trickier because I have to find the probability of a positive result. Well, that's where there are two branches that lead to a positive result. This branch and this branch. Now, they can't happen at the same time, so they're two separate branches. So I have to put both of them separately in the denominator. So I could have the disease and test positive. That's one way of getting a positive result. Or I could not have the disease and still have that 10% chance of testing positive. Both of those branches lead to a positive result. And the denominator doesn't have a condition attached to it. The denominator just says, hey, you need a positive result. And again, there's two different ways that can happen. So now I just got to do the math of this in the grab a calculator for sure. Definitely not going to be able to do this in my head. Well, at least I can. not Maybe you can if you're really good. But the numerator is 0 0.0392. And then the denominator, being very careful to multiply the 0 0.04 times 0 0.98 plus 0 0.96 times 0 0.10. I get 0 0.1352. Divide those numbers out. 0 0.0392 divided by 0.1352, and we get 0.2899. So pretty darn close to a 29% chance. So if you test positive, if you test positive, there's about a 29% chance that you have the disease. Now that may seem weird, and you say, but wait a minute, you tested positive, you should have the disease, right? Well, no, because first off, very few people have the disease in the first place, and most people that test positive actually don't have the disease because that 10% came from the much bigger 96%. So it makes sense that if you have a positive result, there's only 29% chance you have the disease. So most doctors will probably say, hey, we need some further testing. Up next, let's talk about probability with random variables. Now, the key thing with random variables is everything we've already learned still applies, but random variables, the outcome of the event is a numerical value. So before we looked at tornado, earthquake, those are words, female, Male, are you satisfied, not satisfied? Do you have the disease, do you not? Again, those are all words, so that's not random variables because the outcome is a numerical variable or a numerical value. But as soon as the outcome is a numerical value, it becomes a random variable. So a couple of new rules apply here, but all those other ones do too. Now, there are two types of random variables, discrete random variables. There we're thinking typically whole number outcomes versus continuous random variables. This typically lines with the normal distribution, which we'll talk about in a little bit as well. But continuous random variables are where the outcomes 
could be really any number. Like the amount of time it takes to run a race, well, boy, you know, when you start to think about seconds and, and even decimals of a second, the list is more endless. That's where we think about continuous random variables. So let's take a look at a discrete random variable first. So here's what we call a discrete probability model. So again, we see whole number outcomes. So Sally could score in one game of soccer, zero, one, two, three, or four goals. And we see the probabilities attached to each of those outcomes. So pretty cool. Now, she can't score one and three goals. So right away, we know that these are not mutually exclusive events because, or excuse me, they are mutually exclusive events. They cannot occur at the same time. She cannot score one and three goals. So again, only one of these things is going to happen. All of those probabilities add up to 100% or one. So a lot of questions that we could ask here is, you know, I could say, hey, what's the probability that she scores zero or four goals? Well, again, I'm just going to take 0.18. That's probability of zero plus the probability of 4.02. Now, I technically the formula for or says to subtract, but because you can't do both, Sally can't score zero goals and four goals in the same game. So I don't have to worry about subtracting any of the overlap because there is no overlap. There is no and. So again, we get a 20% chance that one or the other of these events occur. We can also ask questions like, hey, what's the probability that the number of goals is greater or equal to one? So at least one, one or more. Well, I could, this would mean one, two, three, or four. So I could add all of these together to get the probability, or I could, actually, this is a great idea. This is something we typically do in a lot of questions. We could always answer a probability question by doing one minus what we don't want. It just makes the math a little bit easier, but whatever, I don't care, you get the answer. But I could do one minus 0.18. So I could get rid of zero goals and I'll be left with one or more. And that's going to be the same thing if I add one, two, three, four probabilities together. One minus 0.18 is going to be 0.82, 82% chance she scores at least one goal. She's a pretty good soccer player. All right, now with discrete probability models, we could also get a sense of their shape, right? Um, you know, and that's the idea is when you're working with numerical data, you could think about shape. So just briefly here, if I put about one, zero, one, two, three, four goals on my x-axis, and I think about these probabilities, zero is 18%, and I could have it a y-axis here if I want to be super specific, but one is much higher at 34%, two is even a little bit higher, and this is a terrible graph, I realize that. Then we got 11% and four is 2%, a lot smaller. But you get a feel for kind of the shape, right? So you'd say it's roughly symmetric. It, it kind of goes down on both sides a little bit. I wouldn't say it's majorly skewed or anything like that, but you can get a cool feel for shape when you're working with the discrete probability model. Now, with the discrete probability model, we also like to think about the long run, the outcome that we expect in the long run. Meaning if Sally were to play many, 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 many games, what is the mean number of goals? Maybe we would do a mu with a G here. The mean number of goals that we would expect her to score in the long run, right? So again, this is the data that we see in this table is what we expect for any one game. But, you know, over the course of, of her career, she's going to play many, many, many games. So what would be the mean number of goals that we would say she has in her career at the end of a season, something like that? So again, this is actually a really easy formula. And again, this row, this I took right off the AP statistics formula sheet, and it even labels it discrete random variables to find the mean or the expected value. That's the E for expected value. It's really simple formula. It looks kind of confusing, but it's actually really simple. You take each outcome times its probability, outcome times probability, outcome times probability, outcome times probability, outcome times probability, and you add them all together. That's it. That's how easy it is to get the mean. But with every mean, I hope you've learned so far in this class, comes a standard deviation for the number of goals as well. Because again, you know, she has an average, but in a single game, that could obviously vary. Now, the formula for standard deviation is also given to you. It's right here. A little bit trickier formula. Don't want to dive too much into it because I'm going to show you a huge shortcut here in a second. But you're going to take each outcome minus the mean. So you've got to find the mean first squared, multiplied by its probability, and then add all those together and then put a giant square root around that. But again, your calculator could actually get both the mean and the standard deviation for you very, very easy. So I just want to briefly show how to do this. So first, you're going to go to stat, edit, and uh, clear out list one, and clear out list two. And in list one, you're going to type in the outcomes. So zero, one, two, three, and four goals. And then next to each outcome in list two, you're going to put the associated probability. So 18%, 0.34%, 0.35%, 0.35%, 0.35%, 0.35%, 0.35%, 0.35%, 0.35%, 0.35%, 0.35%, 0.35%, 0.35%, 0.35%, 0.35%, 0.35%,
0.31. And remember the probability, well, an extra one there. It's like the frequency, right? Like how often you expect that to occur. So I expect her to score three goals 11% of the time. I expect her to score four goals 2% of the time. Oh, not 20.02. Sorry about that. All right, now once that's all into your calculator, check how easy it is to get both the median standard deviation. So you're going to hit stats, slide over to calc, select one variable stats. Under list, that's going to be the list of the outcomes. We're going to put list one. Now, because we have these frequencies, these rates of which these options are going to occur, the 18, 34, 35, 11, 2%, the frequency list we would need to put there is list two. Now, typically that's actually left blank, but we actually want to put list two there by hitting second number two to tell us that, hey, list one are the outcomes, but those outcomes have frequencies that are in list two. And then when we hit calculate here, we get the mean 1.45 at the very top and the standard deviation 0.97. So in the long run, we expect Sally to score, like maybe over the course of her entire career, she averages 1.45 goals per game. But again, that's going to deviate because sometimes she scores less and sometimes she scores more. So the standard deviation there would be 0.973. So pretty cool. We have the formulas, but if you know use your calculator, don't really need the formulas to find the parameters the mean and standard deviation for a discrete probability model. Now, here's another cool type of probability question that often comes up with these probability models. Uh, in this case, we're going to stay with the same uh, model there for Sally Hunter's goals, but it says, what is the probability in two games she scores five total goals? So now we're trying to figure out two games, like two games. What's going to happen over the course of two games? So now we got to think, well, okay, five total goals. Okay. So there's a couple different ways that she could score five total goals. So let's, let's talk about game one and game two. She could score one in game one, four goals in game two. That would result in a total of five goals. She could score four in game one, one in game two. Now that is technically different because these are two different games here and order matters. She could also score two in game one, three in game four, or excuse me, three in game two. That would add up to five. Or she could score three goals in game one, two goals in game two, and that would also add up to five. So again, any possibility that adds up to five would result in her scoring five goals. So now we got to think, um, how do we find these probabilities? Well, it's very simple because these are independent events, right? Well, we have to assume they're independent events at least, right? So we say, okay, the probability that she scores one goal is 0.18 times four goals, 0.02. Now, it's going to be the same mathematics, mathematics here because order of multiplication doesn't matter, but it will look different. For game one, that's 0 0.02 for four, and then 0.18 for one in game two. Game uh, one, two goals, 0.35, three goals, 0.11, or we could do the 0.11 first, that's the three goals, and then times the 0.35 for the two goals. But all of these situations add up to five goals, and only one of them can occur at a time, so that's why we're going to find each of these probabilities and add them all together. So I'm going to go and grab my calculator here, I'll slide it over so you can see my work here. So 0.18 times 0.02 plus, now the other way around, 0.02 times 0.18 plus 0.35 times 0.11, and then again the other way around, plus 0.11 times 0.35. And we get 0.0845 as our total, 0.0845. Now I have a tendency to type things incorrectly in my calculator, so I just wanna go back and double check that work. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, and I'm sure you'll let me know if I'm wrong. But again, that would be the total probability of her getting five goals in two games. You gotta really think about outcomes there and the different types of outcomes and how game one is different than game two. So you can't just do one and four, you gotta do one, four, or four, then one. So hopefully that makes a lot of sense. All right, another type of discrete random variable is a binomial distribution. But most kids think of binomial separate, but binomial is under the umbrella of discrete because the outcomes are whole numbers. So here's the idea with a binomial distribution. The probability of success is given, that's P, as well as a set number of trials. Now the question is, how many successes can you have in those N trials? And you can only have a whole number of successes. Let me give you a really simple example. Uh, let's just say that um, Johnny's going to shoot 
10 free throws. The probability he makes any one free throw is 80%. Well, you know, and I say, okay, how many free throws can he make? Well, he can make all 10. He can make nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, or he could even make zero, but he, it, it, that's it. That's the list. That is a discrete list. No decimal amounts there. And that's it. The end and all be all. That's what makes it discrete. So when we're working with the binomial distribution, we want, again, find the probability of X successes. So here is the formula. Again, I stole this directly off the AP stats formula sheet. There's the formula to find any individual probability. So the probability of one success, two success, three success, all the way up to however many trials you have. You could also have a mean. Again, same kind of thing I talked about with Sally and her goals. You know, what's the expected value in the long run if um, Johnny shoots 10 free throws repeatedly? And we want to look at the average number of makes he gets. The formula for that's pretty straightforward, n times p. But again, sometimes he's going to make more free throws than others. And that's why there's a standard deviation there as well. All these forms are given to you on the AP stats formula sheet. Now, let's really dive into a, a, another specific example so we can actually see how all those formulas I just showed you come into play. So the probability that Mike hits a target with a dart is 85%. Now, there are a couple rules here. First, each, in, each throw has to be independent of the next. That's one rule. The probability of success, 85%, can't change. It's not like it can go up or go down. It's got to stay 85%. Now, Mike's going to throw eight darts. Again, what makes this now binomial is that we have a set number of trials and a set probability. Now, why is this discrete? I'll go through it one more time. Because with eight darts, he can either make eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, or zero. Those are all whole numbers, and it's a finite list. All right, so question is, what's the probability he hits exactly two targets? What is the probability that the number of hits equals two? All right, so three parts to this. First, eight darts, choose two. That's going to tell me how many different ways it can happen. Because of the eight darts, he can make the first two, make the last two, make the middle two, make the first, make the last. A lot of different options for which two he makes. That's going to figure that out for me. Then we have 0.85 to the second, because he does need two makes, and makes has a probability of 85%. Now, he also needs six failures because if he makes two darts, the other six have to be misses. And that probability is easy to figure out in your head as well because there's 85% chance of success, 15% chance of failure. Now, a couple different ways to get this answer. First, that eight choose two. On your calculator, to get that's a little bit weird. It looks a little bit different, but here's how you do it. Type in the eight first. Then you're going to hit the math button, slide over to PRB for probability, and go down to option three for NCR. It's going to automatically put that eight down there as the N, that's the total. And then we're looking for two successes. And this tells you there's 28 different ways it can happen. Then I'm going to multiply that by 0.85 squared, multiply that by 0.15 to the six, and I'll get my probability. Or I could use a huge uh, shortcut here. Second VARs. There's two commands here, one for binomial PDF and one for binomial CDF. PDF will find an exact probability for you, which is perfect. It's actually going to do all this work for me, save me so much time on the exam. So all you got to do is type in the number of trials. Mike's going to have eight throws of the dart. P, the probability of success, is 0.85. And then, well, not 0 0.82, 0 0.85. And then the actual X value is the number of successes you're looking for. We're looking for two makes, two makes and two makes only. And a PDF will do exactly that, nothing more, nothing less. And it's going to do all the math for me all at once. So the probability, make sure you read that E, the negative form, and move the decimal four times to the left. That's going to produce 0.00023. And you may say, well, whoa, well, that's, that's, that's impossible. Well, first off, it's not impossible. It would be very significant if it happened. But why would that happen? Well, Mike's a pretty good at throwing darts. He makes 85% of his throws. So for him to shoot eight darts and only make two should be unlikely because he's actually really good. All right, next question here. What is the probability he hits at least three targets? This is the probability that X is greater than or equal to three. We want him to make three or more targets. That would be three, four, five, six, seven, or eight. So basically, I got to do all this work that I just did for two, but I got to do it for three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's a lot of work. So let me teach you a shortcut. Here's another cool feature of your calculator. This is the binomial CDF. Now, the binomial CDF does this. Again, type in the trials, in this case, eight. Type in the probability of success, 0.85. Now, when I'm doing a CDF, whatever number I put in for X, it's going to automatically calculate that or anything less. So now you got to be careful here because the question wants three or more. So here's what I'm going to do. CDF, if I type in a two, 
Now, because I'm typing in a two, it's going to do two, one, and zero. It's going to do anything, the number I tell it, or anything less. It's going to add all those probabilities together for me in one big swoop. Now, why am I doing this? Because again, there's always two ways to answer a probability question. You can find the probability for what the question says, or you can find the probability for what the question does not say, and then do one minus that. So I can't do above. Your calculator, binomial, it just doesn't do a number or higher. It does a number or lower. So if I'm looking for three or more, I'm going to get rid of two, one, and zero, which my calculator could do very easily for me. So there's the probability of two, one, or zero, but now I have to do one minus that probability to, be fi to find the probability of, of three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So hopefully that logic makes sense. If you need, I have plenty more full videos that go over the binomial distribution, but that's a quick run down how to do it. So 0.9998. So very, very likely. Why is it so likely that he's going to make three or more? Because Mike's a really good at shooting darts at 85%. So that makes sense, I hope. All right, another type of distribution is a geometric distribution. Now, a geometric distribution, um, and again, I took these formulas right off the AP Sets formula sheet, but it's also another discrete distribution, falls under that umbrella of discrete. So here's why. So first, you're only given the probability of success. There is no set number of trials. But what we're looking for is our first success. And that's actually all we care about is our first success. And maybe it takes 20 trials to get that first success. But again, that's all we care about is our first success. And you could say, well, the first success, success happens on your first trial. So th there is one outcome, one. Or maybe your first success happens on your second trial. Well, there's another outcome too. So again, the outcomes are all whole numbers. Now, again, in the long run, we could talk about the average number of trials to get that first success. There's the formula and then the standard deviation as well for the geometric model. Now, here is the formula for finding probabilities and actually makes a whole lot of sense. Let's go back and use Mike's example for a second here. The probability that Mike hits a dart, 85%, but again, no number of trials. Now, what is the probability his first target will be hit on the fifth throw? Now, what this means that we're looking for his first first target hit to be on the fifth throw, that means the first four were all failures. Again, I don't have to worry about how many different ways that can happen because I know that can only happen one way. The first four were all failures. Again, 85% is success, 15% fail. So the first four have to all be 0 0.15, 0 0.15, 0 0.15, 0 0.15, 0.15. And then finally on the fifth throw, he gets his first success. That's it. That's it. That's, that's very simple. I don't have to do any super difficult math to figure that out. So the geometric model is actually a little bit easier. So again, you guys can go to a calculator and figure that math out pretty simple. Next question, though, is a little bit trickier. What is the probability his first target hit will be after the third throw? So there's a couple different ways we can figure this out, but we want the first, we're looking for the first success to be greater than the third, after the third throw. That means the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, the tenth which that's going to actually go on forever, so I don't want to go that route. So I could go the route of finding what I don't want. I don't want it to happen on the first. I don't want it to happen on the second. I don't want it to happen on the third. So not happening on the first, second, third. Figure those out. Not, not very difficult. But there's actually a way easier way to answer this question. So what is the probability his first target will be hit after the third throw? That actually tells me that the first three throws have to all be failures. That's it. That's all I got to do to figure this out. The first three have to all be failures because I want his first to be after the third. But when? The fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth? I don't care. All I know is the first three have to all be failures. So that's how actually how easy it is to answer that question. I don't even need a success because I don't care. I just need the first three to be failures. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. And again, that wraps it up for discrete random variables. Um, hopefully they're not too bad. And again, all those formulas I just showed you are on the AP exam. Next up, we have normal distribution probabilities. Here, you're going to be given the mean and standard deviation of a random variable. And here, it doesn't have to be, but in most cases, it is going to be a discrete random variable. Well, in fact, if it's normal, it has to be discrete or continuous, continuous, I'm sorry. But the idea is that there's too many outcomes to list, including decimals. So in these problems, the good news is you're going to be given the mean and standard deviation, and you're going to be told that you follow a normal model, which is amazing. Now, 
That means we could use Z scores, we could use normal CDF to find probabilities or Z tables if your teacher shows you that. But the most important thing you have to understand here is how random variables are combined to understand mean and standard deviation. There's a couple of rules there and we'll kind of talk about them as we do a couple of these problems. So here is a great normal model problem. So small individual containers of ice cream are filled according to a normal distribution, which is awesome, with a mean of 16 ounces and a standard deviation of 0.05 ounces. Okay, so the fact that it tells me it's a normal model means that Z-scores, normal CDF, are going to be very easy to help me find probabilities. So what is the probability that a container contains less than 15.87 ounces? Now, why is this now a um, random variable? Well, because the outcome is a number. That's one reason why it's a random variable. Why is it continuous? Because, you know, the number of ounces, even if you just use two decimals, is 15.87, 15.88, 15.92, 16.01. I mean, the options are endless. So the question here wants us to find the probability that the container of ice cream is less than 15.87 ounces. So to do this, I need normal CDF on my calculator. That's going to help me find probabilities with the normal model. But to do that, I need a Z-score. So I need to figure out the Z-score for 15.87 ounces. And that's such an easy formula. Everybody at this point should know the Z-score formula. Subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation. So when I go to grab my calculator, I'm going to make sure I do the 15.87 seven minus 16. Make sure you always do that numerator first, hit enter, then divide it by 0 0.05 and I get negative 2.6. So that's my z-score. Now, if you know anything about z-scores, that's fairly low. So finding the probability of containers less than 15.87 is the same as finding a z-score less than negative 2.6. Now, if you know how to use z-tables, you could go and use a z-table. But most of the way I teach, at least, is using normal CDF on our calculator. So we want to start at a low value of negative 99. That's acting like our negative infinity because we want to look way below negative 2.6. And there's no infinity button on our calculator. And then our upper value is actually going to be the negative 2.6 that we're going to stop at. And we're going to go ahead and hit paste here. And that's how easy it is, 0 0.00466. 0 0.00466. So that's very, very low, very, very unlikely. If a container did come back uh, less than that, I would be pretty shocked. I'd be pretty surprised. But again, that's how simple it is to find these probabilities. No, no difficulty there at all. If you want to do greater than, we'll just get your z-score and then start at that z-score and go to an upper value of 99. You could even do in between two values, just get the two z-scores and go lower to upper. Z-score is really, really simple. But here's one where we got to think about combining. This is a great problem. So a crate contains 10 individual ice cream containers. Okay, cool. The crate itself has a weight that also falls in normal distribution with the mean of 20 ounces and a standard deviation of 0.8 ounces. What is the probability a crate weighs over 182 ounces? I'm trying to find the probability that a crate is greater than 182 ounces. So what I got to figure out is what's a crate supposed to weigh? This is where we have to think about combining random variables. Now, a crate in total is going to have 10 individual ice cream containers. Every one of those is supposed to weigh 16 ounces that we saw in the previous problem. So that's 10 times 16 for the 10 individual ice cream containers. Obviously, I could do 16 plus 16 plus 16 plus 16 10 times, but I'm going to multiply by 10 to speed that up. But I also have to add in the crate itself. The crate weighs 20 ounces. I can't forget about the crate because this is the total weight of the crate and the 10 individual ice creams inside of it. So um, that's pretty simple math to do, not overly difficult. Most of you could actually probably even do that in your head. But we get 180 total ounces. That's what's supposed to weigh. But again, every ice cream container can deviate. Even the crate could deviate. So I've got to think about my standard deviation. Now, number one rule is you're not allowed to add standard deviations. You are allowed to add variance. So I have um, the variance for each container of ice cream, as mentioned in the previous question, is 0.05 squared. Now, again, variance is just standard deviation squared. So all I got to do is put a square on there. You don't even have to even do the math. Just put that little square there. Now you got variance. But I got 10 containers. So I got 10 containers each containing 0.05 squared of variance. So I'm still multiplying by 10 to speed up the addition. But I don't square the 10. It's just the 0.05 that gets squared because I'm not allowed to combine standard deviations. I'm only allowed to combine variance. So I got variance for each individual container. Plus, don't forget about the variance for the crate. So the variance for the crate is 0.8 squared. 
And I only have one crate, so I don't have to multiply it by anything. It's only got one crate. So there's my total variance. You're not allowed to add standard deviation. You're only allowed to add variance. But now I've got to turn all this variance back to a standard deviation. And to do that, I'm going to put a giant square root around all of that. That's how I'm going to get back to my standard deviation for the total. So hopefully that all makes sense to you. But again, this is just a review, so hopefully you learned that already. I'm going to type all that in at once, starting off my square root, 0.05 squared times the 10 containers plus the 0.8 squared times one. You think that put times one, but that's for my crate. And that's how I get 0.815 for my standard deviation. So now that I know what is expected for a total crate, I could figure out the probability. But of course, I need a z-score. So the first thing I got to do is find my z-score because I'm asked about 182. So I'm going to subtract the mean of 180, divide by the standard deviation of 0.815. Definitely need a calculator for that. Let me slide this over so you can see that. So 182 minus 180. Always do that work in the numerator first. Then I'm going to divide that by 0.815. And I get point, uh, 2.454, 2.454. So now I want to find the probability that I'm greater than 182. That's a z-score greater than 2.454. If you know how to use a normal table, you could use the tables, but I'm going to go ahead and use normal CDF. This time I want to go greater, so I'm going to start a lower value of 2.454. Going to go to an upper value of 99. And I would get 0 0.0074. 06. Again, pretty unlikely. Why? Because I'm supposed to weigh 180 and I have a very low standard deviation. So being over 182 would be weird. So if this did happen, I would be kind of shocked. I'd be very surprised. I would deem that significant. And I'd maybe try to figure out maybe I had something wrong here. Maybe the mean of my containers was wrong. Maybe the mean of my ice cream was wrong. But anyway, that's a different question. That's how we find the probability. So incorporating the normal model, which is a continuous random variable, but then also understanding how combining random variables is super important for a lot of questions. All right, the last place that um, probability is going to be used on the AP exam is with sampling distributions. Now, there are four types of sampling distributions. Let's start off with two of them dealing with proportions. We can find a sampling distribution for a sample proportion. We can also find a sampling distribution for the difference between two sample proportions. Now, what's best about this is I'm not going to do a ton of examples here because it follows a normal model. You have a mean and you have a standard deviation. Now that's the row for one sample proportion. If we're looking at the difference between two samples, there's my mean, there's my standard deviation formula. Now how do I know it's normal? Well, you just got to make sure that you have enough successes. So any sampling distribution dealing with proportions will be a normal distribution as long as you have 10 or more successes and 10 or more failures. So you do have to check that n times p and n times 1 minus p both are 10 or larger. But once you're normal, which is going to happen in most cases on the AP exam because they want you to use the normal model, then everything I just talked about with the normal model is usable as long as you have your mean and your standard deviation. So pretty simple, but I, again, if you're looking for a little bit more information on what's a sampling distribution, well, please click the video on the top here because I have videos that dive into that way, way more, but hopefully this makes sense. Now, there's two more. There's also a sampling distribution for a sample mean and for a difference between two sample means. And again, I stole these formulas right off the AP Stats formula sheet. Here is for a single pop, a single sample mean. There's the mean, there's the standard deviation. For the difference between two, here's the mean, here's the standard deviation formula. Again, this is right off the AP Stats formula sheet. Now, once again, sampling distributions are normal. But when you're working with means, how do I know for sure I'm normal? Well, if your sample size is 30 or greater, you're definitely going to have a normal sampling distribution, which is awesome because that means I could use z-scores. It means I could use normal CDF. Now, if your population is normal, like the population that you're taking these samples from is already normal, well, then the central limit theorem says sample size doesn't even matter, right? The sample size of four is fine. It doesn't matter. Now, the other thing that makes a sampling distribution normal is if your data itself is already roughly normal with no major outliers, no major skewness. But, you know, that's all, again, a different video that you could spend way more time understanding. But I'm just trying to show you that, you know, if you're presented with a sampling distribution and you're asked probability questions, you need to use the normal CDF. You need to use normal tables. You need to use the normal model. And we love the normal model. It's so easy as long as you have a mean and a standard deviation. And that's what these formulas provide for you. 
Everything will be given to you when you're ready for this. The mean of the population, the standard deviation of the population, which will need to be divided by the square root of your sample size. When it comes with proportions, the only thing you really have to be given is the proportion, right? What is the proportion? And again, you also need your sample size because that's what sampling is, selecting samples. But once you have your mean and your standard deviation, you know your normal as long as you meet those conditions, which is going to happen, I promise you. And, and, and that's why, again, it just goes back to what we already talked about, working with the normal model, using normal CDF, very, very easy stuff. So I know this was kind of a long video, but it also was very detailed in all the different types of probability. And it's not all inclusive. Like I didn't cover every single question that could ever be asked of you with probability, but I hit all the big topics. And if you truly understand them, you can incorporate what I showed you in this video to answer maybe some more difficult or some just simply different types of questions. But hopefully this video helped you and I hope that you enjoyed it. And please study up on probability because it is going to be all over the AP exam.